what a day! What a lovely day! Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. Today we're going to be discussing a grail, a holy grail. And this is a term that, as we've discussed in the past, is severely overused and abused to the point where it's really lost what its meaning is. What I'm going to be showing you today, a knife from Tim Galleon, is a true grail in the strictest definition that really should be used. It is unbelievably difficult to obtain, nearly impossible, uh, whether it be for its exclusivity, it's the only one like it that exists, so it has that, uh, or for cost, this is nearly $5,000. So yes, there's the uh, the grail worthiness in the cost as well, meaning it's going to be very, very difficult to come up with the money or the justification to pay that much money for a pocket folding knife. So this really does check both of the boxes. It is nearly impossible to obtain. Um, I never thought that I would own it, to be honest with you. When I first saw Tim building this uh, he did a lot of work in progress, pictures and videos and whatnot on his Instagram. I went, well, yeah, uh, I absolutely want that knife, and it is absolutely not going to happen. Uh, another reason why this knife is so incredibly grail-worthy is the fact that Tim has had a history in knife making where he will make custom knives for a while, then he'll stop for years and years and years and years and years. Then he'll come back and make a few. Then he'll stop for a few more years. And then he'll come back and make a handful more. And this has been going on since pretty much his career began. Uh, he really is one of the most gifted knife makers that exists in the world today and has ever since, really since he began. And what he did was he took a very long break from custom knife making to design knives with Kai, which is Kershaw Zero Tolerance. And some of you may remember going back to the oh, early 2000s when the original Junkyard Dog series had come out with Kershaw. Everybody went nuts. And I'll pop some pictures up during this video so you can get an idea of the knife that I'm talking about. And it's going to ring that bell. You're going to go, oh yeah, I remember seeing those. And then, of course, he made his custom variations, and then he made a Pro Series, which was a mid-tech. And no matter what it was, they all sold out as quickly as they could be put out for public consumption. And even if you got one of the uh, fairly inexpensive Kershaws, you felt lucky that you got your hands on one because they always got snatched up so quickly. Getting a custom was damn near impossible. Pro Series, I've still never seen a Pro Series in person, in the flesh, ever. So they're all very difficult to get. So just getting one of his customs uh, is grail worthy enough, but to get one that was made in the way that this one was uh, truly is something special and something to behold. And that's why I've taken a while making this video. You guys have seen this on my Instagram now for over a month where I've been carrying it and playing with it and, and doing various things with it. And I really wanted to take my time before I did this video because it's a special knife, it's a special maker, and I wanted to make sure I put as much effort into this as I possibly could to make sure that you guys got the full effect of just how cool this is. And by the way, in case you're wondering, you're watching the action on this, this is on bushings. This is not on bearings. And this shows you the incredible, incredible uh, skill that this man possesses that uh, your old school knife makers, the ones that are really, really super talented, are able to always give you this level of action without having to use bearings. We all get excited about bearings and how smooth they are and drop shutty. You could do that on bushings if you're a really, really good knife maker. So without any further ado, I want to hop down to the tabletop and start showing you this knife close up. We'll show you some uh, photography that I've done on it as well and share with you why I am so excited about this incredible knife.
And here she is up close and personal. What an absolutely beautiful, absolutely gorgeous design. Incredible execution. Um, this is going to be an overwhelmingly positive review, as you can uh, very plainly see, because there's nothing here that you can pick apart. There's nothing here that you can complain about. Now, the design might not be something for everybody, and I certainly understand that. But the execution of this design is absolutely mind-blowing. It's a breathtaking knife in every regard. Let's get the specs out of the way first. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the knife, its origins, where it came from, and uh, how it ended up in my hands, because I am not the original owner of this knife. So starting things off, uh, this is the Tim Galleon Eagle Edition Junkyard Dog, one of a kind, full custom. It's the only version that he's made uh, in this uh, eagle motif, and it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's such a striking design, it stands out among the other incredible knives in his catalog that he's made. You're looking at a titanium frame lock. This is the XL size junkyard dog with an overall length, believe it or not, I'm gonna have to actually fold this a little bit just to get it to the side so that we can put the specs up on the screen. Overall length, if you can believe it, is 10 inches with a four and a quarter inch blade. The blade happens to be CPM 154. It is 61 Rockwell. The inlays are done with carbon fiber, red G10, white G10, and blue G10, and then finished with a 2K auto paint and clear coat in an 11 step process. It's, it's mind numbing to think of all the work that he's done. Uh, you've got a hardened 440C lock insert. The, uh, the hidden pivot inside is a quarter inch 440C uh, hardened pivot and the pocket clip is titanium just like the, uh, the frame of the knife. Now this is technically the Gen 3 of the Junkyard Dog. What I'd like to do here is I'm going to show you guys a bunch of pictures. Uh, I'm going to start off with my own photography from back in 2010, and then I'm going to show you some images that I grabbed off of Google Images because it's the only images that I can find to represent the, uh, the progression of the generations and his work. And then I'm going to show you some work in progress pictures that Tim himself posted on his Instagram. Uh, I apologize to Tim in advance. I, I, don't, I had no way to get his permission to use the images, so I do want to credit him uh, for the images that he took and, and the work that was performed. So let's start things off with where the knife came from. Uh, what I'm popping up here are the images I took of my old Kershaw junkyard dog, and uh, I, I'm not sure what year it was made, but I purchased it secondhand uh, at the end of 2009 or early part of 2010. Um, I never scored a custom Tim Galleon or a Pro Series Tim Galleon. So this is the first time I've had a chance to own a full custom Tim Galleon. Now, you'll notice with the production knives and with the Pro Series, the mid-tech versions, uh, they had the, the fighter plane inspired theme that went throughout them. So you're going to see a lot of that. And this obviously deviates from that. It's still very American. It's still very red, white, and blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't have that that fighter jet theme or, or old uh, fighter plane theme that he's so well known for. In the first generations, you had a lot of choices. You could buy the Kershaw production knives because remember, in and out of his custom making career, he also worked for Kershaw as a designer, creating some incredible knives for Kershaw, which included his uh, JYD series. So you could get a small or a large in the Kershaw, and they did several generations of that, the latest of which is the one that I had. You could get the Galleon Pro series, and that was his mid-tech variation, and there was either two or three, I think there were three sizes, a small, a regular, and a large, if I'm not mistaken. And this goes back a lot of years, so I could be a little bit foggy on it. And then you have the full customs. 
you could have the fighter motif or a lot of other styles with uh, scales, with inlays, uh, knives done in Timascus and things of that nature. And they're very few and far between. They're very hard to come by because Tim took a lot of hiatuses during his career, uh, both not making knives at all and also taking time to simply just work with Kershaw uh, and work with designs for them. Now, the only images I can find online of the, of the full customs are mostly from a dealer, which I don't want to promote. He's one of only two dealers on the planet um, that is just a garbage human being that I don't want to give any promotion to. So I'm not going to steal his photography and, 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 and list them uncredited. But I did find a couple of these images from Google. I want to give photo credit, but I can't read the language uh, from the websites that these came from and the watermarks that are on there aren't very crisp and clear. So, uh, I apologize. If it's you that took the pictures, please let me know. And I will certainly give you credit, uh, in the description of the video. I'm happy to do so. Being a photographer myself, I wouldn't want somebody to steal my images. Now let's talk about this knife. The first thing that you're going to notice besides the size and the colors is the incredible action of this knife. This is on washers, my friends. This is not bearings. And this is every bit as fast and smooth as the best bearing knives that I've owned. And this is what separates the really great makers from everybody else. I'm not saying it's easy to make any folding knife, but it is easier to get a faster, smoother, quicker action with bearings that is with washers because then you're dealing with tolerances you're dealing with the way that everything is fit together just to give you an example um and i don't want to take a custom out here because i don't want you to think i'm picking apart anybody's custom work let's take a production knife and let's look right here and you see how there is almost no room in between the titanium and the steel blade. Now you look here and you see very large gaps between the titanium and the blade. I'll grab another production knife, which may also show that to you. I mean, you can see daylight in between there and you cannot hear. And this is what your high end makers are able to achieve and why their washer knives can be tuned to be every bit as smooth as a bearing knife. It's a certain degree of quality that there are still plenty of knife makers working today that exhibit this. But to be perfectly honest with you, it's easier to work with bearings and a lot of them just choose to do that because, well, it is a little bit easier. And they're gonna take that extra time and put it into their finish work and their inlays and their file work and all these other wonderful things uh, that are available. This thing is, <laughs> It's just sexy from the word go. I will say this, it is large, man. It's a big, almost unwieldy knife. I wish this was a regular size junkyard dog more than anything. And it's the only thing that gives me any trepidation to owning this is the size. While I have carried it and I have enjoyed it, uh, I really would love it to be a little bit smaller. Let me give you some, some frame of reference here. I'm going to put the galleon right down here at the bottom. And I'm going to show you some other knives that you and I commonly would carry to show you a really good size difference. Now, a, a good typical EDC size would be like this Pena X series Mula. It's a three and a quarter inch blade. It just dwarfs the Mula in every aspect, in its length, in its height, uh, thickness, everything. It is insane what the size difference really is. Let's put it up against, uh, let's see what else I have here that's a good common carry size. How about my uh, Dan Carraher 904 in Damasteel? A knife that I really do truly love and I carry often. Huge, huge difference in size. Let's put it up against the r &H Knives Tasca 2, which is a little bigger, so I think it should go closer to the galleon. There you go, there's your size comparison there. 
And as you see, even though the Tasca II is a fairly large knife, it's still just, it pales in comparison to the size of the, uh, of the Junkyard Dog. Let's get a little bit bigger and beefier. Let's get into the EMP EDC Nimble X, which is a three and a half inch blade. So you're getting the idea here. This is a tremendously upsized knife. Put it up against my DSK Tactical Custom. This was the Diamondback V2 prototype that Dan made me. And as big as that knife is, it just, it does not compare. Uh, Zeba Custom, Michael Zeba, he made this for me many, 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 many years ago. This was the S2. Again, huge, huge size difference. What can we get out here that's comparable? All right, my, uh, my Plunkett XL Warney. Another great custom. I love carrying this knife. Even though that's a big knife, and a, a lot of you saw that when I did the review, it still, it just doesn't come close to how crazy... By the way, look at the action on this one, too. Beautiful, beautiful action on that. The closest thing I have is this production knife here. This was the uh, Alpha Smilodon by PMP Knives. There's only one of these. This was... Yeah, this was number one of one. This one comes close when you add in the glass breaker, but it's still not there. The Alpha Smilodon is enormous, still doesn't come close. So that gives you a good idea. And again, we'll, we'll show those tolerances again. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus here. Come on, baby. There we go. That's a good focus job. Thank you. And you see the... Uh, the differences between the gaps of the frame and the blades. There's nothing wrong with how this knife is made, but it just shows you the amount of time and work that goes into this. What I want to do right now, again, I'm going to kind of fold this up a little bit and just kind of lay it there. I want to show you the work in progress pictures that Tim himself posted as he was making this knife because I really want you to feel what I felt when I saw him building this the excitement because he had only made i think two if i'm not mistaken two generation three junkyard dogs prior to this one he had taken so many years off of knife making that most people that you know just started getting into knife making don't even know his name or may have forgotten his incredible legacy and when i saw him come back i was like holy shit tim Gat i think i even made a post like, Tim Gallion's back. Go follow him. This is going to be incredible. And he only made a few knives, and now he's not making knives again. The last time he's made a knife-making post has been over a year. It was 2021, around June. So you see as he's developed this knife, the way that he's done these inlays, the way how deep the pockets are in the titanium to fit these inlays, He's basically used a big, huge, thick piece of blue G10 and then inlaid the multiple pieces of carbon fiber, inlaid the multiple pieces of the red and white G10 into that, into this tub of blue G10, which ends up just creating a border. It's brilliant. And as he was talking about it during the building process, these, these inlays can be removed by him and refinished so that the knife can always look good throughout its life. I love the fact that you don't see hardware on the presentation side of the knife. I also see the, the, the incredible length of time that he spent making this knife. That when he made the announcement to do the auction for it, we were all ready. I, I knew it was going to be above my pay grade. I just sat back and watched. The highest bid that was on there was not the winning bid. My friend who ended up getting this knife uh, had made a private bid that did not go on his page that was uh, quite a bit higher than the highest bid that's on his page that you can reference. And all of that is higher than the knife that he sold previous to this um, he made as a lotto. It, it was a little bit less intricate in the inlays and the way that it was made. And I'm going to show you that right here. And you can see the price in his post that he charged for that one as a direct maker price. 
So when I say that this knife is worth around $5,000 now, at this point, I think it might even be worth more than that, and I might be, be being a little bit generous on that. Here's the downside to owning a knife like this. It's sometimes hard for a lot of people to justify carrying a knife of this magnitude because, I mean, do you really want to scratch up a knife like this? Do you ever want to risk dropping it and dinging or chipping the titanium frame or the pocket clips snagging on your steering wheel as you get into your car and bending it out and ruining it? There are a lot of reasons that people don't carry knives of this caliber. I do. I always have. Because for me, part of the enjoyment is carrying and even using the knives that I own. Like I've told you before, there's only one knife that I own that I've only carried one time, just to be able to say that I carried it, and I will never, ever, ever carry it again. Because the finishing process was was made from uh, the Academy Awards Oscars gold because Michael Zebo was making the the gold plating for the Oscars, for the Academy uh, that year when he made that knife for me and used the exact same gold and the exact same finish so it can never be replicated. If I ever damage it, it that's it. I'm screwed. But every other knife I've owned, regardless of price, uh, and I have spent more than this on knives, uh, I've always carried and I've always just loved and enjoyed. But there are plenty of people that will buy a knife like this and simply put it in a case, put a little single halogen bulb over it, and just look at it every day. And that's their enjoyment. They're using it like a piece of art. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Enjoy your knives for however you want to enjoy your knives. Not everybody's going to want to carry something like that. I'll tell you right now, if I owned you know, uh, a $20,000 Cabot 1911, I wouldn't be out on the range shooting it every weekend. I probably wouldn't even carry it because there's a certain grade you get to that you're like, eh, my appreciation is going to be in the beauty and not so much in the function. This one, I've been enjoying the function. I would have regardless, but I'm going to tell you why specifically that I have right now. Because the original owner, the gentleman, uh, my friend that bought this that actually won the auction, carried and used it. And when I get the lighting just right, you'll see the scratches in the hand rub. And this, believe it or not, is the good side. Here, it takes a little bit of work to see it, which I'm thankful for because it doesn't just jump out at you. There are a ton of scratches on this side. There, wait, there we go. My studio lighting really is masking it. Usually it uh, hyper-accentuates stuff like that. Anyway, I'm not really able to show it, but this side is much more scratched up. Wow, that's crazy. It doesn't want to show up. See, like, you can kind of see it there, but, like, you take this out in the in the daylight, and, man, you cannot miss it. Or, like, when I'm taking it out of my pocket at the end of the night and I'm in my kitchen, my kitchen lights really show off the scratches badly, too. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, you're not really going to see them until you're looking for them. But this side's actually uh, much worse than this side. And there you're able to see the scratches there. So that makes it a bit easier for me to carry it because the, the original owner loved it and carried it and used it as well. Here's the downside to it, though. Tim isn't making knives right now. And what I've heard, I do not know Tim personally. I want to make that very clear. That's why I was nervous about making this video. Because most of the time when I bring a high-end custom out to you, it's either a knife maker that I know, uh, that I'm friends with, or I've gotten to know during the process of the build or the review. And we've talked back and forth. We've discussed the knife in detail. We've discussed uh, their philosophies in detail. I have never had contact with Tim. Tim doesn't know I exist, doesn't know who I am. Um, I've been a fan of his, but have never met him, even at Blade Show or anything else, because that's how long he was out of the game. The problem is right now, what I have heard is he's having some significant health issues that prevent him from doing the hard work like hand rubbing blades. And I could tell you from my own experience, having the cervical spine issues that I do, when I go to hand rub a blade, that's my day. I stop. I put aside for that day. I'm going to do uh, my hand rub. I'm going to get it done. 
and then I'm stopping work for the rest of the day. And it's probably going to take me two or three days of painkillers to be able to get back to working at any capacity after that. So I understand the problem with that. So for me, I went, well, you know what? I need this knife. I want to buy it. I'll just have him do a spa and redo the blade finish. And then I found that out. I'm like, well, that's still not going to stop me from, from buying the knife. The other problem is, uh, you guys know I'm very close friends with Todd Begg. Todd and Tim have been friends for probably about 20 years. They've known each other for a long, long time. They have a great admiration for one another. Uh, Todd speaks about Tim in, in, in such a wonderful way. Uh, he has a tremendous amount of respect uh, for him as a knife maker and as an individual. So I, I can really tell there's a lot of love there. Um, so I went to Todd. And I, I brought it over to his shop right after I got it. I said, listen, I said, I, I've gotten really good at hand rubs, but I am not going <laughs> to attempt to do the work on this if Tim is unable to. I said, if, if, if there's a way for me to reach out to him and ask him, would you mind redoing the hand rub? He's like, I would be happy to do it if Tim gave me permission to do so. He goes, but the problem is his maker's mark is very, very superficial on this blade. It doesn't go down into the steel. It's just on the very top layer. He goes, as soon as I go to swipe it, it's going to take that clean off. So I would actually need uh, one of his stencils in order to reapply his maker's mark. And if you really look, you'll see where there's even some light spots when he etched his logo. There you go. You can see it there. So it's, it's not perfect in that way. And here's the thing. I've sent Tim messages through Instagram He's never read them. He doesn't know that, that I sent them. He's never seen them. So basically, the knife is going to exist as it is. If I ever find a way to get a hold of him, I am definitely going to have it refinished just so that it's 100% perfect because who wouldn't want it to be? Now, let's talk about his incredible grinds. Um, as I've mentioned in the past and when I showed you when I was making the Hellraiser Mini and I gave you guys that, that shop experience where I made those three videos, one of the things that I pride myself on being able to do that I learned from Todd are the sweeping plunges. And these are done properly. So you have the radius plunge here and it sweeps in from the full thickness of the blade stock down to the edge. So this is a proper sweeping plunge. This is the way you would have seen it done by Stan Wilson, or you would have seen it done by Todd, by Tim, by uh, Neil Blackwood, by so many incredible makers. Some makers today that do sweeping plunges will do one or the other. They'll do a radius plunge, but they come in really, really sharply. Or they'll come in very shallow here with that graduated sweep, and yet it still won't be very radius up at the top. And I prefer to do both because it is more challenging and it adds a little bit more drama. This thing is just pure sexy from the word go. From the way he ground it to the beautiful finish work, that hand rub is incredible. Very, very high grit hand rub. If I had to guess, I'd say 12 to 1500 grit hand rub beautifully done but what really made this knife a must own for me is the handle work to see these inlays this glossy finish this is like if you were buying a bugatti or a mclaren or a pagani and you look at the carbon fiber in the tub or in the, the in, in in the body work and you see the beautiful, perfect weave, and you see this glass-like smooth finish to the carbon fiber. That's what he's done here with this 2K automotive finish. He's also done that back here. So your backspacer is also carbon fiber with blue G10 sandwiched in between the carbon fiber pieces, and it's finished the same way. I mean, even looking at the backspacer is breathtaking. And feeling all of this, it is, it's truly seamless. If I Helen Keller it, if I sit here and I close my eyes and I just run my fingers all around it, I cannot tell where the titanium ends and the inlays begin. 
except for the, the difference of this gloss versus this bead blasted feeling. That's it. It is perfectly seamless. You can't tell at all the differences in the inlays because all of that was done perfectly matched and then this this automotive finish has been done over it with the multiple layers of clear coat. I believe Tim said there was an 11 step process in doing these scales. Let me see if I can give you some crazy super tight shots. Does my camera want to focus or not? Come on. I'd really love it to because I really want you to see. There we go. I mean, holy shit, man. There's a couple little scratches in it from being carried. It's just, it's mind boggling. There you see the end cut carbon fiber. Look at the detail, even in the way that he sculpted this clip. I mean, it's, it's nuts, the amount of work that he's put into this knife. All of these inlays, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of carbon fiber, one piece of red, one piece of white, this huge tub of blue that creates that border, another piece of blue in there. I mean, there's, there's so many different section pieces. It's truly insane. Now, on this side, the hardware that you see is still very minimal. The two body screws, the screw that holds in the steel insert for the lock face, and then the back side of the pivot, should you have to make any adjustments whatsoever, which I have not had to do even once. Action. Is, I mean, look at that. It's just incredible. Yeah, it's very easy to get excited about a knife of this level. Now, a lot of people may not like the huge size of the flipper tab, but this goes back to the original Generation 1. This is part of the design and how it looks. Yeah, he could make a flipper tab that's a third of the height, and it would function just as well because his detent is perfect. And when I say perfect, I don't mean it's a really crazy, scary, hard detent so that you can get a super crazy action, which is what I have here on my Ziba. It's a very, very hard detent. I believe it's even a flat face detent to, in order to get that action. Look at that. That's on bearings, and even though it's, it's a pretty good action, it's still not this. This breaks like a glass rod. It just... It's just incredible. I can't shake the blade out, and that's a big, heavy blade, but it's completely effortless to break the detent when you're flipping it. Obviously, it's going to be perfectly centered. My God, if, if you were somebody that couldn't center your damn blades, there's no way you'd make a backspacer like that because that would be the ultimate tattletale, wouldn't it? Tim is a legend for a reason. And I sincerely hope that he is able to get back into making knives once again because his work should be celebrated. It's been celebrated for decades. Your older collectors all know the name. They all understand the prestige that's involved with owning one of his knives. And I would love for more people to be able to do so. Let me give you a weight on this because we talked about everything else, but we didn't talk about the weight. Oh. Woo! I told you that's a big boy. 7.7 .7 ounces. Heaviest knife I have on the table behind that would probably be this. Wow, that's a, it's actually heavier. Well, that is all titanium. No inlay work. Remember, those, those channels he cut in here were very, very deep. So let's do that again. So 7.7 .7 .7 ounces. Put it up against... My DSK, 6.8. I've always felt that was a real pocket hog, a really, really heavy knife. Beautiful, great, super beefy, way, way thicker in the blade stock, as you can see. 
Then you get something like this. It's, you know, much easier to carry. 3.4 ounces. 4.8 ounces. 3.6 ounces. So we're talking about a knife that is going to be substantial, not only in the way that it looks, but in the, even the way that it carries. But do I give a shit? Not in any way. The way that I came about this was a good friend of mine. Uh, he lives overseas and he says, hey, I'm going to be selling a whole bunch of knives through a, a dealer. Um, I know that you're always looking for really cool content, cool stuff to review. Uh, how about I send all the knives over to you? You review what you want to review and then send them all to the dealer. I'm like, great, super. I'd love to do it. And he showed me this. I'm like, holy shit, you're the one that got that? I'm like, I obsessed over that knife as Tim was doing the work in progress pictures. I dreamt of owning that knife. I'm like, I know I'm going to regret asking this, but how much? I have to have it. How much? And he gave me a price, gave me a very good price. And I'm like, well, I can't do it right now. I, I just came out of three months of not being able to work because of my cervical spine injuries. And I'm just kind of trying to catch up with everything. And, and I've got some other big stuff coming up really soon. And I just, I just can't justify it. I said, but I've got seven production knives that are going to be coming out through various uh, manufacturers. Would you be able to wait till like maybe December, January for me to pay it off? I said, I, I know it's a lot to ask, but I just can't do it right now. But I don't want to let this slip to my fingers. He's like, you know what? Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Photograph it, review it, keep it on you, do what you want to do with it. And he goes, and then if, if something happens and something crazy happens in your life and you can't afford it, then we'll pass it on and it'll still get sold. So it's no big deal. So I waited, oh, with bated breath as this thing was being shipped from overseas and it got here and I tore into the package and I ignored everything else and I went straight to this and went, oh, it was everything I dreamt it would be. Later that night is when I saw the scratches and I went, man, I said, you already gave me a very, very, very good deal because I know you'd be selling this probably between five and 6,000, you know, I, I just, I don't know that I could justify even the price that we agreed on with all the scratches. I didn't know that you carried it, um, but I'm going to carry it too anyway. So I don't know. I'm conflicted. He's like, don't be conflicted. I'll tell you what, I'll give you this price just to make it fair. He goes, I, I didn't even think to mention it. This is, this is what's so great about friendships within our community. That people are honest, that people aren't trying to rip other people off. And I went, yeah, uh, okay. I, the, definitely hundred percent going to take it. So that's the story of how it came to be in my collection. I haven't been in the financial position to buy something like this for a very long time, just because I put all of the money back into my own business, into my own knife making. Um, and it's hard for me to justify sometimes anything more than maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. So this knife was so special to me that I am, you know, basically putting myself in debt in the future to make sure that I had it. So to my friend who I know is watching this, thank you ever so much for making this a possibility for me. Um, it's a big deal for me. It's a big deal for you. Um, it, it, it does. It means a lot. And to Tim Gallion, if you ever happen to see this video, the work is incredible. Um, this is in my definition of a grail worthy knife in every respect from the design to the exclusivity, to the price, to the finishing, the workmanship, everything that goes into this knife to make it what it is. This is a grail knife. And, uh, boy, I still want a regular size in the fighter motif. So God, if you ever make more of those, I'm going to find a way to get one of those. But uh, anyway, guys, I wanted to share this special piece with you. Um, it's not really a review. It's more of a gushing and showing you why I'm so excited about it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, it's taken me a long time to sit down and make this video because I wanted to give it the proper amount of attention and not rush through it. That's why this video is the length that it is. But it was important that I do the knife justice. I only wish I could have done what I typically do with all of my reviews and give you more of a background on the maker than I was able to, but 
like I said, I, I don't have a way to contact Mr. Galleon. I've tried. I've sent him messages, and he's unaware that I've sent them. I do not think he's ignored them. There's been no read receipts, so it's not his fault at all. I would have loved to have given you a, a deeper background on him and his ideas behind the junkyard dog, why he's why he designed it the way that he did, and, and why he's gone to Generation 3, why this particular variation was made. But unfortunately, I was unable to do so. Um, maybe I could do a follow-up video someday in the future. I would love to. But for now, there it is. The Junkyard Dog Gen 3 Eagle Edition Full Custom. Tim Galleon, legendary maker, making what I feel is going to be a legendary knife that a lot of people already know about. And I think it's going to live on forever. And people are always going to wish that he had made more than one of these because it is that spectacular. And hey, man, I'm, I'm a patriotic dude. I love America. I love my country. And the red, white, and blue theme, I love that. But I'm also a motorcycle guy. So I, I that ties in with my love uh, of motorcycles. If I were a boat guy, it would, it would tie in with racing boats as well. There's, there's just something so, and I don't even want to say American about it, but there's something so manly about it. The colors, the angles, the shape, the way that everything was done in this particular theme, it just fired on all cylinders for me and made me want it even more. Thank you guys for sharing the time with me. I certainly very much appreciate it. And uh, I've got some big surprises coming for you very, very soon. So please stay tuned. If you're not subscribed already, I would highly suggest subscribing because I'm about to change my format again just a little bit, make it a little bit better and make it better for you in the end. And I'll see you guys on the next video.